Welcome to Tales of the Night Sky. In these podcasts, I'll be telling you ancient stories and astral myths about the stars and constellations. What could possibly make a king and queen sacrifice their only daughter to a sea monster? Find out in this, our fourth episode, the first of a two-parter about the Princess Andromeda. You can find Andromeda within the Perseus family of constellations, along with her mother, Queen Cassiopeia, and her father, King Cepheus. The easiest way to locate this group is to first look for Queen Cassiopeia's asterism, which is in the shape of a W. Andromeda's constellation lies south of her mother, while King Cepheus faces the open side of his wife's W. To understand how this royal family became catastrophized, let me take you to the mythical kingdom of Ethiopia. Andromeda Listen, do you hear? Something is stirring in the depths of the ocean. Some creature has been summoned and is slowly rising. Andromeda, princess of Ethiopia, knows it is coming. Coming to take her life. Look, she sits calmly on a wooden chair in the centre of her room, facing the water. This is not the picture of the doomed princess you expected to see. Her breathing is regular, and only the black curls of her hair move slightly as she inhales, exhales. Her dark skin seems to glow as the light dims. Watch as she closes her eyes. She has come to accept her approaching death. She is sifting through her memories, trying to make peace with her life, before they come and tie her to the rocks. The wind is rising, and the gusts shake the window frames, bringing in the salty tang of the sea. Andromeda imagines that wind rushing in and grasping her, invisible arms pulling her through the window, out of the room, high over the rising waters, over the crowd that awaits the sea monster and the spectacle of her death, over the cliffs so that they look like no more than little rocks. And all that ever was now seems insignificant. The wind takes her up above the clouds, into the blue, where all is stillness. From here, she imagines looking down, looking down onto Ethiopia, the kingdom she has loved all these years, and seeing her own life like a little ribbon caught up in the tangle of so many other lives. She would like to remain suspended here until the end of time. But below her, the sea sparkles and shivers with the reflection of her parents' dusty red palace. The building itself, thin pillars reaching up to her, statues of heroes and mythical creatures, arms and limbs outstretched from the upper reaches, beseeching her to return inside. So she descends and approaches this palace hewn into the rocks. She glides down through an opening at the topmost level of the building and enters a circular room.
musk and myrrh combine in a heavy perfume here. The smell of her mother. Andromeda hovers near the ceiling and looks down onto hundreds of candles flickering and down onto the marvellous interlocking coils and plaits of her mother's hair. Queen Cassiopeia sits facing a huge circular mirror as if at the very centre of the universe. One reflection is not enough for her. She holds a second mirror, small, bronze, in her right hand. She holds it as a king might hold a scepter. On the back of it is the bronze relief of a Nereid riding a sea monster. The sea maiden sits on the monster's back, her arms curled around its coiling neck. The two beings seem to intermingle. Andromeda has always wondered if the tail that curls and swirls and ends in a pointed fin is that of the Nereid or of the sea creature. Queen Cassiopeia has eyes only for herself. Eyes that are lustrous with lashes and thick with coal. She has forgotten the daughter who stands behind her. The floating Andromeda looks down on this old self. She sees the young woman she was, dressed in a simple robe, stifling in the thick air of the room. She has never liked this place. The incense and perfume make her cough. The cough makes her mother turn and remember her daughter. Darling, she whispers, look at me. Aren't I lovely? As lovely as... She searches for a suitable comparison. She looks at herself in the bronze mirror, turns it around, catches sight of the image and then says, I am as lovely as a Nereid. Andromeda nods unhappily. In fact, darling, continues the queen, I'd say I'm even more lovely than a Nereid. Wouldn't you? The floating Andromeda sees this moment for what it really is. Like a knife thrown into flesh, Cassiopeia's words tear into nature itself. The Nereids are beautiful, kind and immortal. And immortals do not suffer the vanity of mortals. Did you hear? The queen says she's more beautiful than the Nereids. Did you Did you hear? The queen says she's more beautiful than the Nereids. Did you hear? The queen says she's more beautiful than the Nereids. Andromeda opens her eyes. She is back in this moment, in her room, facing the sea. Let your hand brush over her cheeks and wipe away her silent tears. She stands now, walks over to her bed, then lies down as the light outside continues to fade. The sea shakes and growls. The monster is drawing closer. Her eyelids close once more and Andromeda sees herself in the palace throne room, sitting at her father's feet. King Cepheus struggles to be a good king, but responsibility weighs on his shoulders and they sag. She never really noticed until today how gaunt her father's face is, how grey his hair. He is crumpling like an old leaf in the face of the news. What has your mother done? He asks. The Nereids 
are insulted. The god of the sea is angry, and his punishment is wild, unsparing. Poseidon will destroy us all. What can we do? She holds his hand. She loves him terribly. She knows how hard he tries to be good and fair. She hopes that he will find a way out of this judgment. But what he says next surprises her. We must go and see the oracle. The room shudders. Andromeda floats far away from this memory. Did did you hear? The The king king and queen queen will see the oracle. oracle. Did you you hear? hear? The The king king and queen queen will will see the oracle. oracle. Did you hear? The king and queen queen will will see the oracle. oracle. darkness outside. In this small room, here by the sea, Andromeda's heart beats fast, a fish caught in a net. Her stillness unsettled, she wishes for father, mother to comfort her. But this is something they cannot do. She knows what they are, what they have done to her. The memory of their betrayal is one she would rather not revisit. But that memory tugs at her, tugs so hard that she is hurled up again, back through time, back to that moment when she is standing in front of the palace gates. The wind rages. She has tamed her hair with a scarf, but her robes whip about her. She is awaiting her parents' return. Return from the Oracle. They appear in the distance, carried in their palanquins, preceded by soldiers and slaves, and from where she stands, it looks like a terrible and giant spider is approaching. Just before they reach the palace gates, her father dismounts and runs to her, takes her in his arms, weeps and weeps. He shakes his head. I am so sorry, my child. So, so sorry. She knows then what they have done. Struck a bargain. They'll throw her out into the sea to save themselves, to keep their palace, their power, their riches, their glory. Did you hear? Did you hear? Andromeda will be sacrificed. Did you hear? Andromeda will be sacrificed. Did you hear? The light slowly tears open the sky. Dawn. Footsteps outside her door. The door opens. Two servants enter, their heads veiled. Andromeda sits up slowly, lets the servants chain her arms and lead her out. The waves growl and rumble ever deeper. Cetus, the great monster, is almost here. She's heard that he's serpentine, hoary-faced, sucks his prey into his mouth and down, down into his bottomless coils. She's heard others say his teeth are high as houses and pierce through metal and bones. She settles on the image of a giant fish with large bulging eyes and spiky boned back and tries to make her peace with it. The time has come. She walks through those palace gates, 
into the rush of sea air, the booming of the waves, the water rising higher. Thousands of people gathered in silence, clothed in yellow. She is attending her own funeral. Her eyes take in the shine of these people, dressed in sunlight, glowing with life. Her mother and father, on a rock, higher up, cling to each other like orphan children. Her mother's ochre face, draped in bronze and gold jewellery, a mask. Her father has let a beard grow long on his chin. His eyes are dark holes. Andromeda, seeing them, feels nothing. Her personality is a distant memory. These people that she called father, mother, are just frightened souls trying to hold on to the little shreds of their lives. How extraordinary that she could once have cared. They attach her arms to a great metal ring above her head. The lyre players begin their dirges. The blood drains out of her arms. Numbness. The sounds around her increase. The crowd grows fearful. People are crying, praying. The waves drum loud and fast. Her body is cold and heavy as a stone. The smell of seaweed, the rise of the sea, the crowd hysterical now. Mother, father, calling her name, calling her. summoned and is slowly rising. rising. 